question number one that was uh, sent during the week. Some prominent Christians are saying we don't need to forgive someone unless they repent because God does not forgive us until we repent. Is it ever biblically is it biblically ever okay to hold bitterness or hardness of heart towards someone? Can it be backed up biblically that we should forgive all people? I would hope so, but I'm currently concerned and confused about this issue. Saying we don't need to forgive someone unless they repent. Let's stop there. All right, so here we have a a software that I use. Can everyone see that? Um, and this is BibleHub.com. So this is a great uh, resource that I like to use. And you can see here we've got, uh, you know, multiple verses or, or multiple translations of a verse. And then over here in this section we have an area that gives us some greater context, cross-references on the right-hand side. And uh, if you scroll down, you can even see other uh, other verses that are somewhat related. And if we scroll all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, we start to see some commentaries that are speaking to this specific verse. And then you can also get links to some of the Greek or Hebrew concordances. And you can see sort of the root words. And, and uh, in the future, we'll, we'll talk more about that. So first things first. Um, the question is, some prominent Christians are saying, we don't need to forgive someone unless they repent. So what does God say here? And I'll just read from the ESV. If you for, This is in the Lord's Prayer, right? This is Jesus speaking, telling us how... This is a way for us to pray regularly. So this is a core teaching that, that God wants us to know about. If you forgive others their trespasses, also uh, the, the word trespass here is, uh, is translated as sin in Matthew and in, I believe... Uh, Luke, it is trans, is it Luke? Either Luke or Mark, it's translated as debts. Um, I believe it's Mark. Anyway, that's what trespasses is. It's, it's sin in some, uh, in one book, and it is debt in another book. And so if you forgive others their sins or debts, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And I'm just going to go ahead and go like this so we can see both verses side by side. So this is what Jesus wants us to pray. We're asking God, forgive us our debts, right? Our, our sins. So sins or debts. Forgive us our trespasses as we also have forgiven our debtors. Right, And so we're asking God, forgive us just in the same way that we have forgiven others. And then Jesus tells us explicitly after this, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So should we forgive people only if they're willing to repent? Is that what God wants us to do? No, we, we are to forgive them because God forgives us. We're to forgive them because God forgives us. And so, um, so the latter half of this verse, the question was, God does not forgive us until we repent. God does not forgive us until we repent. And so uh, we, we want to get away from this error of thinking, I'm, 
I'm saved, I'm forgiven, but if I sin, then I fall back down, and then if I repent, then I'm saved again, and if I sin, then I'm not saved until I repent, and if I repent, then I'm saved again and forgiven. And so we keep our ultimate forgiveness is based on this ongoing need to repent over and over and over again. And if we ever fall short in that area, then we're not forgiven and our sins are held against us. And so that's an extremely dangerous teaching that actually uh, gets us closer to something like what Roman Catholics believe, um, although they would say it's not any sin. It's only mortal sins that cause you to lose your salvation, lose your forgiveness, step outside of or be cast outside of God's forgiveness until we repent and then we can be forgiven again. That's not true. We are justified by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus alone. And so it's not our um, it's not that singular act of repentance that is needed in order for us to be forgiven. It's that the overall um, posture of repentance. It's that overall, we, we were going in one direction, rebelling against God. We repented. We, did, we turned around. We did Repentance means to turn and go back in the opposite direction. So we repented from our rebellion to God, did a 180 and started following God and started walking towards him. And along that walking of that journey, we'll stumble and we'll fall short. We'll make mistakes. Um, I believe we we covered this in last week's uh, episode. We were, um, you know, we'll fall short. We'll, we'll make mistakes. We might sin. We might even intentionally sin, give in to temptation. But it's that posture of repentance. Uh, Once we're born again, we are in a position of being forgiven of all of our sins. So once we're born again, we're made a new creation. And... We are in Christ and we are justified, meaning we are declared innocent and blameless under the law according to God. So we are obviously forgiven if we are justified and blameless. And so in Matthew uh, 18, starting at verse 21, it says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or that could also be translated as 70 times seven, right? So how many times does God want us to forgive people? As many times as it takes, okay? So he said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So this is like millions of dollars. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. So this is us. We have this this, this enormous sin debt against God because he is righteous and holy and we are far from righteous. We're sinful. And God sees us and he says, okay, I will have pity, I will have pity, you know, pity on you. I will have, you know, I will give you grace and mercy. And he releases him. It says out of pity for him, uh, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. This is God forgiving us our debt. And then it says, but when that servant came, went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So he has this little small amount that he's owed, this little small sin against him, that an offense against him. And he's like, you, you're, you're going to get, a, you're going to have to pay exactly what you owe. 
I'm not going to give you grace or mercy. His fellow servant fell, fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? So this is what God says to us. I gave you grace and mercy and forgave you of all the sins you did against me. I let the blood of my son cover over all of your sin. And it wasn't because you were great and righteous and you paid me back. It was my own mercy, my own grace. And if we go out and hold people against that, hold their sins against us, instead of giving them the same grace and mercy that God has shown us, it's, it's actually the first sign is that we have not been saved yet. If we have truly received God's forgiveness and truly embraced the gospel, then that should transform our heart and mind so that we also extend that same love and grace and mercy towards other people. And if we are hard-hearted and hateful and bitter and are unwilling to forgive other people, then it means that we probably have not been transformed by the gospel and we might not even be saved. And at the very least, even if we have been saved, this is something that we actually touch on in in the Freedom Friday program and in deliverance because there is a consequence to your unforgiveness. And so here's what God says. So even if you're saved, worst case scenario, you're not even saved. If you're not extending this same grace and mercy and forgiveness to other people, you might not be saved. But let's say you are saved. There's still a consequence for these singular, let, let's say you, you forgive most people, but there's one person you're really having a hard time forgiving because they're not repenting. And this is what God says. This is what Jesus says in his parable. He goes, um, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And he says, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So there are, he's, he has given this person who is unwilling to forgive the one who sinned against him. He is given over to the jailers, right? Those, the executors of the punishment of his sin until he should pay all of his debt, right? And so you actually reap the consequences of your own sin against God if you are unwilling to forgive the sin of the person who sinned against you. So what we actually see is when there's a lot of times when people are being tormented by demons or having some kind of demonic stronghold in their life, they are having unforgiveness in their heart. And so the demons sort of come in and say, we have a legal right to be here and we are harming and hurting this person, but we have a right to do so. We have a right to do so. And the person may say, well, wh I'm, but I'm saved. Why, do, why are there demons in my life? And this, this parable that Jesus taught teaches this principle that if you still have sin that can be held against you, then the enemy has a right to be in your life. And so it's a little bit of a, of a segue away from from the question, but I think there's a powerful principle there. You need to, you need to forgive. Um, you need to forgive other people, whether or not they repent. 
whether or not they repent. And I've heard it said that uh, holding bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart against someone is like swallowing poison and hoping it kills the other guy. It kills you when you hang on to the unforgiveness and the bitterness. It kills you. It, it, it prevents your restoration to your relationship with God. It prevents your uh, walking in the blessings and the provision given to us by Jesus because you're holding yourself in that prison. You're, you think you're keeping that person who hurt you in a prison, but really you're keeping yourself in this prison. This, you know, the, in this parable, it says God is the one who puts you in the prison, but you're the one choosing to be there because you're unwilling to forgive the person who harmed you. And because you're unwilling to do that, God doesn't excuse you from the consequences of your own sin against him. Um, and so the other part of that, is it biblically ever okay to hold bitterness or hardness? Uh, no, no, it's never okay. Um, this is what Jesus has to say. In Matthew 5.44, he says, you know, in 43, it says, You have heard that it was said, love your, enemy, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. These people are not repentant. They're not repentant. They are still your enemy. They are still persecuting you. But if we're willing to do that, we are sons of our Father in Heaven. We're more like Him when we forgive those who are after us. And we can look at some other uh, cross-references, right? Right? Luke 6.27, Jesus said, But to those of you who will listen, say, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Right? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Even Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Right? This is what God's will is for us. So no, we should not hold bitterness. We should not hold hardness of heart. It will hurt us. It will hurt us. Um, can it be backed up biblically that we should forgive all people? Hopefully I've done a sufficient job enough uh, to cover it. This is a super important thing. Your unwillingness to do it will cause harm to your relationship with God. It will cause harm to your ability to be fully, uh, to walk in freedom from a demonic influence and bondage. It will uh, cause you to hinder the work of the Holy Spirit, which includes love, peace, joy. So in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, so these are characteristics of the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. It includes love. You need to act loving towards other people. That's what the Holy Spirit wants you to be doing. You need to be pursuing peace. Peace first with you and God, and the forgiveness is necessary for that. And peace with other people. Peace with other people. Uh, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Um, Paul wrote, uh, Do not repay evil, anyone evil for evil. Right? Don't don't go out of your way to hurt the people who are trying to hurt you. And as Matthew five described, that's in the heart too. It doesn't mean don't just murder the person who's trying to murder you. Don't have hatred in your heart, which would be murder of the heart against the person who maybe murdered someone you loved. Don't even hate them. Don't repay evil for evil. Carefully consider what is right in the eyes of everybody. And if it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So 
what does God want you to do? He wants you to live in forgiveness and in pursue peace with everyone and forgive them whether they repent or not. Um, you know, he, and, and I'll actually, I'm going to turn the, I'll turn this into another question just so it's not a super long question. But a lot of times people ask me this question, do I need to forgive people who are not willing to repent because my spouse won't repent or this friend or family member or person in my church or this politician or whoever is evil and they won't repent. Do I need to still support them? Do I still need to now, obviously if it's a uh, spouse, then there's a deeper level of involvement. Um, but let's say it's a friend. Let's say I have a friend who continues to sin and won't repent. And now we already read earlier, Jesus said, he told Peter, forgive him 70 times seven or 77 times, right? As many times as it takes, forgive them. But we need to understand the difference. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness is means that you are no longer holding against them the consequences of their sin as though you're their judge, as though you're the one who determines their punishment and are holding that wrath in your heart against them. Right? That's what it, the, the verse we just read, vengeance belongs to the Lord. He's the judge. He's the one who sees all the details, who, he, who knows their entire life, everything they've been through, every single thought, every single feeling, uh, all of it. He's the one who can judge and determine what is right or wrong for this person. We don't need to be in that place. We can't be in that place. And we, we shouldn't want to be in that place where, like, I'm going to decide that they, don't, they haven't repented yet. It's up to me, and I don't think it was um, sincere. And so I'm, I'm going to hold it against them. We don't want that burden. We have, we have to forgive them and release them to the Lord. Let him decide. I guarantee everyone one of two things will happen. They will either find Jesus at some point, truly repent of their sin, and be forgiven and covered by the blood of Christ and have a transformed life, or they will rise at the resurrection and appear at the great white throne judgment on the last day and have to answer to God for every single one of their sins. So they will not be getting away with it just because we choose to forgive them. They are still going to have these sins dealt with. They are either going to have to bring it to Jesus and confess that sin and lay it down and and you know and have to sometimes we have to make restitution like if you've stolen from somebody you need to make it right with them before God forgives you you can't just say I'm sorry God and then keep what you stole right and so they might have to do that as well they might have to confess their sin and so either that or they answer to it on judgment day either way justice will be served so we don't have to be the one who decides that we will execute the justice and the wrath. God will do it. Our forgiveness is us saying, God, I release them to you. You choose. You choose. And if we are unwilling to do, you know, if they're unwilling to do that, they'll have demons and they'll have other consequences of that, of that decision. And so, um, but there's a difference between forgiveness and restoration. I can forgive someone, my brother, like my brother who sins against me 70 times. I can choose to forgive him. But I don't have to go out of my way to have a, a, a good relationship with him. I don't have to keep inviting him over for dinner every night if he's going to sin against me every day. right? I, just because I'm choosing not to hold wrath or hatred in my heart against him doesn't mean I have to be friends with him. Because you don't have to do that. When we tell people, this is true of, you know, the person who murdered someone in your family. It's true of the person who, 
molested you or raped you or who stole from you or whatever evil was done that you have a hard time forgiving this person for, you don't have to pursue a relationship with that person. In fact, a lot of people we should actively distance ourselves from and not have a relationship with those people because they're toxic, harmful people who um, are, they need to feel the distance in the relationship. And, you know, in first Corinthians, Paul was talking to them about this guy who was sleeping with his father's wife. And he said, he won't repent. He said, remove this person from your church. He goes, hand them over to Satan and hopefully the Lord would bring them to repentance. And so he wasn't allowed back into the church fellowship until he repented and saw and admitted that what he was doing was evil. So this way the church communicates, you're not okay. You're not in the right place with God unless you repent. And you're not in right relationship with us unless you repent. But that is different than us saying, we're going to hold it against you and have hatred and bitterness in our heart or being the one to execute the justice and wrath for God. We say, no, I'm just going to leave you out there, unprotected by the church, unprotected by your relationship with God. And Satan's going to have his way with you and he's going to beat you up. And God will hopefully use that to help you bring, help you come to repentance, right? Sometimes Satan needs to beat us down for a while. The, the natural consequences of our sinful rebellion. And then hopefully God gives people the wisdom and they turn and they repent. They wake up after getting beat around. And so, no, but we never want to hang on to it ourselves, And, um, and we want to have those parameters where we're not pursuing a relationship with an abusive, toxic person. You don't need to keep them in your life. And if, it, and, and if this was a spouse, separate from the spouse and don't reconcile until they get the help that they need until they repent. You can forgive them right now in this very moment, in this minute. But you don't have to pursue reconciliation of, a, of the relationship unless they're willing to repent. All right, so I talked for a lot. Let me take a look at the notes and see if um, if there's any uh, any follow up um, part that I didn't cover. Um, one person said it could be very bad to have hardness of heart towards a spouse. It, uh, it basically encourages divorce. So this makes sense that God would require us to forgive our spouse. Yeah, and we, we need to forgive everyone. Hopefully I've made that case. Um, let's see. Yeah, yep, we, we got to forgive no matter what um, and pursue reconciliation. Like Paul wrote, pursue peace whenever possible. As far as on your part, that's what he said. As far as, um, let's see. Where was that? That was Romans 12, 18. If it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone, right? If it, When it comes to you, quickly forget, forgive everybody. And if you can, have a re great relationship, reconciliation with everyone. But if, they're, but if they're not willing to have a relationship with you, if they're not willing to have peace, right, in a non-abusive, non-toxic, non, you know, relationship that will break down your faith and your relationship with God and your health, um, that's not being at peace. <laughs> and so, but as far as it goes on your part, live at peace with everyone. Um, and as far as what they do, sometimes we need to hand them over to Satan for the destruction and hopefully uh, God will bring them to repentance. Um, 